Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd on the Street, and today I'm going to show you how to use the recovery partition in Pop! OS on your System76 computer. All right, guys, I do want to state for the record here, this video is not associated with System76. This is a Nerd on the Street video. However, I've become more closely acquainted with System76 computers over the last few months. And one of the things I've learned about them is that they actually ship if you order with Pop! OS as your operating system, they ship with a recovery partition on them that allows you to recover from system failures on the software side of things. Now, if you order your computer from System76 with Ubuntu, then you're not going to have a recovery partition, and in that case, you would need to burn a live USB disk in order to perform the steps I'm about to show you. But if you order with Pop! OS, which I highly recommend you do if you're watching these sorts of videos, your System76 computer will come with a recovery partition that's very easy to get into, and let's say that something happens with your package manager or with your graphics drivers or just anything in the software that keeps you from being able to use your computer, you're gonna be able to boot into this recovery partition. It's basically a live installation disk built into a small partition on your SSD or hard drive. And from there, you can ch root into your system and actually recover the system. Now, System76 has a number of support articles that walk you through the steps I'm about to show you, but I have some firsthand knowledge that a lot of people either don't read those articles or don't understand them, and so that's why I'm showing you this in video form today to walk you through those steps and kind of explain what we're doing, which I've gotten a lot of experience with over the last few months as well. So without further ado, we're going to be using this System76 Bonobo Extreme computer, or Bonobo Workstation actually, I think. Very large computer, uh, but it doesn't matter if you've got this or a Galago or any of the the, the products that they offer, the recovery partition steps on Pop! OS are the same. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and cut to our capture card, and I'll show you guys this process. All right, guys, so here we are in front of the computer. The first thing you're going to need to do if your computer's not working properly is turn that thing off. You can do that in a variety of ways depending on where you're at in terms of the computer not working. If you can access the menu in the top right of the screen, you can use that. If you're at a terminal, you should be able to type sudo space systemctl space power off and that should shut the machine down. Or if you're having NVIDIA issues and the entire machine's frozen, you can hold down the power button until the computer turns off. You don't wanna do that on a regular basis, but in an emergency, it will suffice. Once the computer is powered off, we are going to enter into recovery mode by powering the machine on while holding down the space bar. So we are going to push the power button and hold down the space bar. Now, this is only for more recent computers, and by recent, I mean the last five years at least that are shipping with UEFI firmware and will be using the System D boot boot menu. This is what the System D boot boot menu looks like and it is extremely small on this particular machine because this Bonobo workstation has a 4K screen which uses software scaling to make everything larger in software once the computer is turned on but the bootloader does not have that scaling so we're seeing it in real size. The most important thing here is that you're going to go to the third option which should say Pop! OS Recovery. The first option here is to boot into the current Pop! OS kernel which is the default option. The second option will be to boot into the previous kernel version so the current version minus one and then the third option in this system D boot menu should say pop OS recovery use your arrow keys on the keyboard to get to the pop OS recovery option and then press the enter key to select it and after we select that we're going to start seeing our system boot up and here we have our default wallpaper I've got a message there about a mouse I have plugged in we can dismiss that and here we are in pop OS recovery so the first thing you'll notice here is this install pop OS dialog box and if you're seeing this at this time it's very likely the version number is going to be older than the current version for instance this bonobo workstation was running pop 19.10 here we have the installer for pop 19.04 that's because the recovery partition as of right now never gets updated it is a single image that is shipped from the factory and even though you can upgrade your Pop! OS installation, the recovery image is gonna stay whatever version was shipped from the factory right now. That will change in the future. Now, normally I just tell people to ignore this window, but if you do want to actually dismiss it, you can just select your language 
and then after four clicks. Here, when we get to the point of selecting our storage device to install Pop! OS 2, we obviously don't want to actually reinstall our operating system right now because ostensibly there are some really important files on this machine that we need to recover. That's why we're in Pop! Recovery. So we're gonna click on Try Demo Mode and that will close the installer. And now, this is a fully functional, basically live disk and you can use your system. If you're on Wi-Fi, you can go ahead and connect and I'm actually gonna do that right now connect to my own Wi-Fi access point. And you're probably going to want to do that too because in a second here, we're going to pull up Firefox now that I see we're connected to Wi-Fi. The great thing about Pop! OS Recovery is that since it is a fully functional live disk, you can open up a web browser and you can go to support.system76.com and you can copy and paste a lot of commands out of the articles that are here. And the first article we're going to look for is called Use the Recovery Partition. We're going to click into that one. And this is going to give us instructions for accessing our installed system from the recovery partition. So we'll make this Firefox window a bit smaller and we're going to open up a terminal. And here's where we can start actually doing some work. So lsblk is the first command we're gonna to wanna to run. And this is going to show you the disks in your system. Now, if you're using the default partitioning scheme that your computer shipped with, one of these partitions is going to be mounted at slash CD-ROM, and this is the recovery partition that we are booted from right now. You can see in my machine, it's SDA2. On that same disk, on your main disk that your OS is installed on, you're going to want to look for two important partitions. The first one is the largest partition here, um, and you can see 224.4 gigabytes SDA3 is my largest partition. Now, if you've got a newer machine, this probably won't say SDA3. It will probably say something like NVMe 0 in one p 3 And that confuses people a lot because it's a lot more characters. And these future commands are going to be referencing your partition. So you need to make note of which partition is the largest partition, that's gonna be your OS partition. Write down what that is called because we're going to use it in a moment. The other one we're gonna to wanna to look for is the first partition on the disk, which should be 512 megabytes all the time if you're using the default partitioning scheme. This is the boot partition, so this is where our bootloader is. This is where systemd boot puts its configuration files. And this is where our kernel image and our initial RAM disk are actually stored so that our computer can boot from them. So that's also important, but first we just need to mount that main OS drive. And you can see there is a command here to do that. However, that command's not what we want because I am using full disk encryption on this system. Now, if you're not using full disk encryption, you can skip these instructions under the encrypted disk section of this article. And you can just run a command like sudo mount dev sda3 and the mount point that we're going to be using is called slash mnt. The live disk includes that directory already created so that you can easily mount things to it. Because we're using full disk encryption, we have to decrypt the disk before we can mount it. And it's very easy to do that. The command for it is right here. So sudo crypt setup lux open, I'll copy that. You can paste into your terminal with control shift V or you can just right click and click paste. Then you're going to need to put the path to your OS partition. So once again, this might be slash dev slash NVMe0 in 1P3 if you've got a newer machine or if yours is like mine here and you've got SDA labeled partitions, it's just slash dev slash SDA3 and then space crypt data. So let's take a look at what we're doing here. Crypt setup is the name of the command. This is the command that we use to work with encrypted partitions. Lux open is what we are doing to this partition. We're trying to open it up. Crypt data is going to be the name of the encrypted volume that we are opening. And this is the default name that System76 machines will use. So we're going to enter that command. It's asking you for your disk encryption password. So normally you turn on your computer. If you're using Pop! OS, you've got that gray screen with a password box in the very middle. And it just says something about how you need to enter your password to decrypt the disk. It's that same first password that you're using here. I'll type mine in, and after a second, we will return to a new line. At this point, we can run the next command, and once again, I'll demonstrate the copy-paste skills because I highly recommend you guys use that. LV scan is going to scan for our Lux volumes that we currently have. You can see we've got dev data root here. That's the one we just unlocked. And this one already says that it's active, but 
just in case it's not, we're gonna wanna run VG change space dash A Y just to change that volume to active. And now we can actually mount the volume. This is the mount command. Once again, System76 makes it so freaking easy for you. So this is a regular mount command. We're mounting dev mapper data root, which is going to be the default path that that encrypted volume is going to map to. And we're mounting it to the slash MNT directory. We'll run that. And now let's say that you were trying to just copy your files off so that you can do a clean install or something. You're just trying to to do some data recovery. At this point, you can actually navigate to slash MNT on your system, and this is your installed system. So if we just go to other locations in our file manager and we go to computer, this is the live disk that we're seeing right now, but we double click into MNT, and this is your installed system. Once again, we can tell because if we go into the home folder, we've got a couple of home folders here with our usernames from the installed system. You can see my normal user on this computer is called Jacob, and then I also had a temporary user called Extra Life that I created a couple of weeks ago when I was using this computer at Extra Life. And we can go in here and we can actually see, I don't have very many files on this computer, but you can see all of your personal files here. Now I also want to point out that this is a great way to actually find your username if you don't know it. And you might be saying, well, Jacob, how would somebody not know their username? Well, the default login screen, the GDM login screen, it's going to show you actually full names of people. If we pull up a screenshot here, the default login screen will show you a first and last name with capitalization and spaces, and that's probably not what your username actually is. So if you're having an issue where you can't get into the GUI, but you do have a full screen terminal that you can try and log into, uh, but if the computer keeps telling you that you've got the wrong username or password, and you think you're typing your password incorrectly, the issue is probably that you don't know your own username. Um, and if you haven't been working with Linux for a long time, then you might not realize that your username is not something like Jacob Kaufman, for instance. Your username is just gonna be, in my case, Jacob. So just the first name, all lowercase. I've also seen it to where it's somebody's full name, but still all lowercase, no spaces. So if you actually need to find out what your username is, then one way you can do that is by mounting your system from a live disk. We now have root access to the system, basically. And if we CD into slash mount slash home and then do an LS, this is a list of the users on our system. Moving on from that though, let's say that we actually do want to perform some maintenance on our installed system from recovery here. We're trying to recover our system. We can't just have the OS partition mounted. We also need the boot partition mounted because that's very important. That's one of the things that if you're in recovery, maybe your boot partition is what needs fixing. Uh, your bootloader is, is corrupted, it can't find the right kernel image to boot or something like that. So once again, from our LSBLK output, we saw that our, our boot partition was SDA1. And we can also see that if we run sudo fdisk-l for lists. This is going to give you a list of your disks, and for each disk, it's going to give you a list of quote unquote devices, which are actually your partitions. We can see here, dev SDA3 is going to be our largest partition, so you know it's the OS partition. And SDA1, not only do we know it's the boot partition because it's 512 megabytes, which is usually what you want to be dedicated to your bootloader on your hard drive, is the first 512 megabytes of the drive. But we can also tell it's the boot partition because the type is listed as EFI system. EFI, of course, stands for Extensible Firmware Interface. And this system does not use a legacy BIOS, it uses EFI. So we've got an EFI partition there. So we've got a command right here to mount, so let's copy and paste it and then I'll explain it. Once again, this is just a simple mount command. We are mounting our boot partition, which is at dev SDA1, which we found from our previous commands. And we're mounting it to slash MNT slash boot slash EFI. Now, when you actually boot up your system, when everything is working normally, on Pop! OS, your EFI partition will always be mounted at slash boot slash EFI. There are some distributions that mount the EFI partition right at slash boot, and other distros that mount it at boot slash EFI. Pop! mounts it at boot slash EFI. Now, the reason we can't just use slash boot slash EFI in this command here is obviously because we are running in a live disk, so this root is our live disk or rather this root is just our live disk. So if we mounted this to slash boot slash EFI, um, we would just be mounting it for the live disk, but that won't set it up in the proper way relative to our OS partition that we've already mounted at slash MNT. You need to start thinking of slash MNT as your root. 
uh, because we're about to ch root or change root into slash mnt. You'll see what that means in a moment. But for now, we are mounting our boot partition into a subdirectory of the OS partition that we already mounted a moment ago with that other command. So we'll run that. We've got Another command here, and this is one of the ones that it really is easier for you to pull up this support website and copy and paste it rather than typing it all out. I've had to read people this command over the phone before and people make typos and for good reason. It's a long command. Uh, what this command is doing is it's mounting five different directories. Uh, you see on Linux and in Unix-like systems, everything is supposed to be represented as a file somewhere on your system. Every piece of hardware is actually represented by files. But those files aren't real files. They're just placeholders representing your hardware. Um, and so these aren't actually files that exist on your disk. All of these places, slash dev stands for device, uh, dev slash PTS, proc for processes, sys for system, and slash run, all five of these directories, they are virtual directories that are created by the Linux kernel when your system boots. And so right now we are booted into our live disk. So we've got these directories in our live disk, but they're not going to exist in our OS partition because guess what? Our normal installed OS is not what we're booted from. Once again, we're booted from the live disk. So since we're about to ch root into our OS partition, some of the later commands are going to require access to some of these files. Once we go into this ch root, we're basically only going to have access to things within the ch root until we leave it. From a security standpoint, a ch root is not actually limiting to where you can't get out of it, but a lot of programs are written just to expect that these directories exist. So we need to make sure they're there within our ch root, which is going to be in slash mnt. So this command here, it's saying for i, and this is a variable, in all of these five directories. So for each of these items, we are going to mount that item to slash mnt slash the exact same place. So dev is going to be mounted to slash mnt slash dev. Proc is going to be mounted to slash mnt slash proc. And the reason why they've put all five of those items on one line is because otherwise it would just have to be five separate lines. And if you're copying and pasting, this truly is easier. So we will press enter on that. Next, we are going to copy our resolve.conf into our slash mnt slash etc directory. And this is going to give us an error message. Now this error message is normal. I would still recommend you run the command. Once we get into our ch root, resolve.conf is what your system kind of uses to figure out what its DNS servers are supposed to be. If you don't have a resolve.conf, then you might be able to ping an IP address from within your ch root, but you won't be able to access anything by domain name. And apt is going to be looking for archive.ubuntu.com, and it's going to be looking for launchpad.net as well. So we need to be able to resolve those domain names. And for that, we need resolve.conf once again to exist within our ch root. The reason we're getting this error message here is because if we do an ls-al on etsy resolve.conf, you'll see it's actually a link. It's a symbolic link to systemd resolve d. So this was not always the case. There are some distributions where resolve.conf is a real file, and then there are other distributions where systemd is actually running a little DNS server on your system, and resolve.conf is just pointing to systemd. Now that link already existed if we do an ls-al on slash mnt slash etc slash resolve.conf. You can see it's a sim link to the same directory, and it looks like it uses a relative file path for that link. So theoretically, we shouldn't need this command as long as we mounted slash run, then this link should be pointing to the slash run directory within our ch root. But this command is still written on the support article, and I would still recommend you run it because I have seen issues when people don't run it, and then they ask why it didn't work, and well, it's because you didn't follow the article. So finally, we are going to copy and paste our ch root command. We're running this as sudo because we want to ch root into this system as root so that we can run apt and other commands as root from within our installed system. We are just going to change our root, our working root into slash mnt. We'll press enter. And now you can see we are at root at recovery. Our prompt has changed to indicate we are now the root user. Now, if we changed root into our installed system, the installed system's host name was not recovery. And this is an artifact of how ch root works and how we set up our ch root here. From a networking perspective, we are still booted from the live disk here. So packets are still gonna be coming from the recovery partition, which is what we're booted from first and foremost. 
but now we've got the root prompt and it's kind of tough to tell if this actually worked because it might look like it worked when it actually didn't if you screwed up one of these earlier sections. So my recommended way to figure out if you're actually in your ch root or not after you ch root into slash mnt, you're definitely gonna be in slash mnt, but to find out if you're in your installed OS, we can cd into slash home and then do an ls and you should see just like we did earlier, you should see your installed systems usernames. So if you're in slash home and you see your installed systems usernames, then you know your ch rooted into the installed system. If I open up another terminal and I run that exact same command, cd slash home and then ls, you'll see the only user in our recovery partition is called recovery and our regular users do not exist within the recovery partition. So if you can run these two commands and you see your users, you're in your ch root. So now what? Well, there are two other articles here on the System76 support website and one of them is called Fix Package Manager Issues. And this one right off the bat is going to clear up a lot of issues. If your computer wasn't booting properly because you put it to sleep and or shut it off while it was in the middle of running updates, for instance, um, or even if it was running updates and you didn't shut it off improperly, uh, but the updates failed, something went wrong, and now we need to recover from that. These package manager maintenance commands are actually very comprehensive. We'll go through each of them right now. So the first one is sudo apt clean and actually we don't need sudo for any of these right now because we are ch rooted in using sudo so everything we run is going to be run as a root user we'll run apt clean that is basically just clearing out cache from apt so downloaded packages that you had before Obviously, if something's gone wrong, you're gonna to wanna to re-download them and make sure that you've got intact packages rather than trusting whatever is on your system's hard drive or SSD already. Because on the off chance that something downloaded wrong and your package manager didn't catch it, it might just keep trying to use the same corrupted files over and over again. The next one is apt update space dash m. Now the dash m here stands for ignore missing, as in missing release files and other issues that might be in our configured repositories. When we run apt update here, it's going to go through in all of our configured repositories, it's going to grab the release files from and read what the most up-to-date versions of all of our packages are. Now, if there's an issue in your configured repositories, you're probably going to want to know about that. And generally you'll still see error messages for it, even if you do use the dash M. So dash M will not suppress all errors and warnings, but it will suppress certain messages that you don't really need to worry about if you're the type of person who needs to look up a support article for this stuff. The next command is a dpackage command. It's sudo dpackage dash dash configure dash A. And the A stands for all. Now on a healthy system, that's going to run and not do anything. If you see any output whatsoever from that, then something was messed up on your computer before, and this command is supposed to fix it. This fixes partially configured packages. Say that you are in the middle of installing updates, but there was some sort of user response required. The system was trying to ask you a question about how you wanted to proceed with one of these updates, but maybe you were using a GUI front end instead of running your updates in a terminal, and the front end wasn't built to handle the terminal asking the user questions. You might not have even had a chance um, in that case, because your system might not have showed you that there was a package asking you a question about its configuration. So eventually the GUI either times out or something ended that update in the middle of the update. And now you've got partially configured packages. So dpackage dash dash configure dash A will fix that. Anything that is not completely configured, it will configure and it will ask you the appropriate questions to do that. The next command is sudo apt install dash F and the F stands for fix. If you have any broken dependencies on your system or if the dependency tree is not satisfied, apt install dash F is supposed to fix that. If you somehow manage to upgrade one package before upgrading something that it depends on, or if you're just flat out missing dependencies. This is basically an empty operation. Once again, on a healthy system, it will not do anything, but it will check your dependency tree. And if there are any problems with the dependency tree, it will install, upgrade, or downgrade the necessary packages to fix that. The next command here is sudo apt dist dash upgrade. Now, a lot of people, especially those people who are running Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, because they don't know what an LTS is actually for, 
they get very concerned about dist-upgrade. They say, oh, well, I'm running LTS for no reason, and I don't want to upgrade to 19.10 or whatever the latest version is, and they'll almost refuse to run this dist-upgrade command, because why would they run dist-upgrade if they're not trying to upgrade their distribution? But dist-upgrade doesn't actually upgrade your Ubuntu release version. The command for that is actually a completely separate command called do-release-upgrade. Dist-upgrade, what this does, it's the exact same thing as running an apt upgrade, which is the normal thing to do if you're installing updates on your system, except a dist upgrade, it's able to be more malleable with your system. It's able to do more. Um, say for instance, that one package needs to be downgraded in order for another package that has an update available to be upgraded. Regular old apt upgrade might just not upgrade that other package, whereas dist upgrade, it says do whatever you need to do to get those upgrades installed. So this will not change your release version. If you're running 18.04, you will still be running 18.04 after running this command. The reason it's called dist upgrade is because in Debian, you actually do use this to upgrade your release version, but you can't just run this in Debian. You have to change your sources files first in Debian, which Generally in Ubuntu is not how we do things. We don't change the sources files manually when we're doing release upgrades. Now, all of that said, there's another command that is equivalent to dist upgrade and that's full dash upgrade. These two are the exact same commands, dist dash upgrade and full dash upgrade. And so just to avoid confusing people, when people come to me and are having me help them fix their broken system, I'll usually just tell them to run full dash upgrade unless they're following this specific guide and copying and pasting. Uh, because full upgrade sounds less scary to some people than dist upgrade. So we're going to run sudo apt full upgrade. Uh, the reason, though, that it's dist upgrade in here is because the full dash upgrade synonym did not exist in earlier versions of Ubuntu. It used to just be dist dash upgrade. And there are a few other ones. Full dash upgrade does exist in 18.04. Um, there are some other ones that were introduced after 18.04, and you have to be careful with what version you're working with. But you can run sudo apt full upgrade or dist upgrade, and it will install package updates. Now, sometimes this is what you need to do to fix your broken system. Believe it or not, uh, sometimes packages get released with bugs. Sometimes you'll have an update that contains bugs, and it will break your system, and then they'll release a fix, um, and you can't boot your system to apply the fix, but if you can boot into recovery mode and ch root in in a terminal and just apply updates, sometimes that will actually fix your issue. Another good thing about installing updates is that it does things like what you just saw right here. These kernel stub lines are configuring my bootloader as part of a kernel update, which is normal. So let's say that I had a completely unrelated issue with my bootloader. The issue had nothing to do with packages or package managers or updates at all. My bootloader was corrupted or I, I misconfigured it and now my system won't boot. Sometimes all you have to do is install updates and if there happens to be a kernel update available, it will automatically regenerate your bootloader as part of the update. And bam, problem solved, you can boot again. So there's really no reason not to run all these commands if your system's not working. And then the last one is apt auto remove dash dash purge. And it's generally a good idea to run auto remove anytime you're running updates just at the end of it because obsolete dependencies, things that your system used to need that it does not anymore, you wanna clear that stuff out so that it's not sitting around taking up space in your hard drive, so that it's not causing issues in the future. And the dash dash purge just means we're getting rid of the configuration files and everything with it uh, because you absolutely don't need those anymore. Now, sometimes just running through these six commands one time will not fix your problem. Uh, but I have had plenty of issues where the solution lies within these six commands, but you just have to change the order a bit. I've seen problems before where you have to run apt install dash F, then you have to run dpackage configure, then you can install updates. It really depends on what the exact problem is, what exactly you did to screw up your computer. This order is logical, it makes sense, and it will usually work, but if running through it once doesn't work, um, and let's say that you're not familiar enough with the messages, the errors and warnings and just general informational messages. 
that these give out, you know, I'm able to see the output from any one of these commands and I can tell you, you know, if that output is good or bad and I can tell you if it indicates that we should run another one of these. But even if you're not able to read the output of these commands, running all of them twice, for instance, will not hurt anything at all. You know, just now the system was not actually broken when I went to make this video. So the first four commands did absolutely nothing you saw, but I was able to run them anyway. Um, so if you were on one of those super corner cases where this order wouldn't work for you, you would actually need to run apt install dash F, then you would need to run dpackage configure dash A. Well, if you run these all through twice, then you are running this in your first go through of these commands. Then in your second repetition, you are running dpackage after you've already run apt install the first time. And so that will fix your issue. And you want to be in a position where you can run all of these commands and basically nothing will happen. Um, apt update is going to check for updates. You wanna see all packages are up to date. Uh, dpackage configure, you don't want any output from apt install dash F, you don't want it to do anything. The dist upgrade, you want it to show you that nothing is available for update and then the auto remove once again should do absolutely nothing if your system is entirely up to date and healthy. So there are some problems I have with apt in the way that packages are handled on Ubuntu, uh, but I will say it is a very resilient package manager and you can fix it 99% of the time using a combination of those commands. Finally though, let's say that your bootloader is the issue. Like we said before, there is a third article here called Repair the Bootloader, and this is the one you'd want to look at for repairing Grub or systemd boot. Now, if you're running Ubuntu, you're gonna be running Grub. If you're using Pop! OS, you're using systemd boot. And either Grub or systemd boot can actually be used for EFI or for legacy BIOS. And so this article is kind of long and it can look overwhelming if you're not sure what you're looking for. Basically what you need to ask yourself is, first of all, am I using Grub or systemd boot? It should be fairly easy to tell that because if you're using Pop! OS 18.04 or above, once again, you're on systemd boot. If you're using Ubuntu, you've got Grub. Um, another way to tell is that the, the menu at the beginning of this video, if you held down your space bar and you saw that menu that included reboot to firmware interface, that's definitely systemd boot. And if your menu says grub at the top, then it's grub. So we're going to assume that you're running systemd boot like I am here because this video is about the pop OS recovery partition. So we will scroll down to the systemd boot section and you are going to need to figure out if you're booted in EFI or not. An easy way to tell this was, remember earlier in the process when I ran sudo fdisk-l and we saw that our boot partition was an EFI system. Well, if your system is booted in BIOS mode, then you would have no reason to have an EFI partition. In fact, you might not even have a separate boot partition at all if you're in BIOS mode, uh, but if you do, it's not gonna show up as EFI system. It would probably say Microsoft Basic Data or FAT32 or something like that. But really in a BIOS boot setup, the most important boot files are gonna be in your master boot record, which is not a partition per se, like it is in EFI. So we know that we're in EFI mode. Uh, System76 gives us a big long command here that you can also use to tell if you're in BIOS or EFI mode. And this is a very long command, but all that it's doing is checking if this directory exists. And you don't need this command for that. You can just run ls-al sys firmware EFI. If you've got files in here, you're definitely in EFI mode because once again, sys, this is not a real directory. This is a virtual directory that the Linux kernel created when we booted our system up. It saw that it had EFI firmware variables and it created these directories and these files, quote unquote, are actually just showing us the variables in our firmware, which is pretty neat. So if this directory has files in it, then you are booted in UEFI mode. If this directory does not exist, if you get something like no such file or directory, then you're in BIOS mode. So now that we know we are in UEFI mode, let's proceed. Once again, you need to know if you're using NVMe or SATA. The only reason you need to know that is because it changes whether you type in SDA for SATA or NVMe zero in one P for NVMe. We already saw that we're on a SATA system. If you buy a computer from System76 today, it's gonna be NVMe, that's why this one's listed first. But for the SATA steps, we can skip all of this because we're already in our ch root. We can skip right down to this apt install command. Now we could use apt reinstall 
instead of apt install dash dash reinstall. The reason why they put apt install dash dash reinstall the longer version here is because Ubuntu 18.04 and POP 18.04 apt in those versions did not have a reinstall command. If you typed apt reinstall, you'll see here it is a valid command on my 19.10 system. It would say invalid option reinstall if you're running 18.04. But since we're on 19.10, let's run apt reinstall. And then they give you a couple packages that you can reinstall here. These are Linux generic and Linux headers generic. This is a Linux kernel that we are reinstalling here. Now I am going to append one more here and that is Linux dash system 76. When this support article was written, pop OS just pulled in the same upstream Ubuntu kernel that Ubuntu was already shipping, the generic kernel. At this point, system 76 is actually shipping their own custom kernel version. It's not actually super custom. They're basically backporting the 19.10 kernel, which is 5.3 two older releases of Ubuntu for hardware support because some of their products will not have wireless or video or other important things like that if you're on kernel versions older than 5.3. So they created a package called Linux-System76. They made the System76 driver package depend on this package. So if you have the System76 driver installed, you are going to pull in the 5.3 kernel. So I'm gonna tack that onto the end of this command here. We're going to reinstall those and you'll see even though we just saw there were no updates available, we're gonna re-download the kernel anyway. You can see we are downloading the kernel from ppa.launchpad.net slash system76, not from Ubuntu, because like I just explained, we're running the custom kernel version 5.3.0. So that just reinstalled our kernel. Uh, the next thing we'll want to do is run update dash init ram fs dash c dash k all. The dash C here means we are creating a new init RAM FS, and this stands for the initial RAM file system or initial RAM disk. This is the image that your computer actually extracts from your storage device into your RAM uh, to kickstart the installed system. That's the job of the bootloader is to locate this initial RAM disk image and to extract it into your RAM. The dash K all means we're generating an init RAM FS for each installed kernel that we have. You could also specify a specific kernel version such as this. I'm not sure if just the numbers would work. I think you would need more than that to specify which kernel version you want to generate an init RAM FS for. But we're just going to do it for everything installed, which should only be two versions. All right, you can see we got some warnings here, and if this computer does not happen to turn on after we finish here, then I might be worried about these, but I'm not too worried about them at the moment. If we scroll down a bit here, this is the important part. Our system found our installed kernels. You can see the update in at RAMFS script is going to call kernel stub, and that is going to copy the kernel into the ESP or EFI system partition, which is that partition that is mounted at slash boot slash EFI, or right now it's mounted at slash MNT slash boot slash EFI if we weren't in our CH root. So that is excellent. You can see it's placed a kernel image in boot VM Linux. The Z there is because it's compressed and then it's placed an init RAM disk at slash boot slash init rd dot img. It has copied those into the ESP so that system deboot when we boot in EFI mode can actually extract that RAM disk and boot that kernel. So now we're going to exit out of our ch root. This last command does not need to be run from within the ch root. Uh, it is the boot ctl command. You can tell from the ctl at the end of the command it is part of system D boot. And what we're telling it right now is that we want to install our bootloader to the path slash mnt slash boot slash efi. And just to demonstrate once again, if we run an lsblk, you can see that sda1, which is our 512 megabyte partition, it was the efi system partition from our fdisk output, sudo fdisk dash l right there, EFI system partition. That is booted to slash MNT slash boot slash EFI, so that's why we are specifying the path to install to. If you run this while you're in your, your booted system, your normally working system, it's completely, well, I won't say it's completely safe, but you can open up a terminal and run sudo boot ctl install without specifying a path if you're booted normally. And that normally won't cause any issues because the default location to install to is slash boot slash EFI. It will actually check, I think, boot EFI and just slash boot. It will check which one of those is your EFI system partition. 
Uh, but if it's anything other than those two, which it is at this point, because we've got the slash M and T at the beginning, we have to specify it manually. So we will install it. You can see that's very quick because kernel stub actually took care of copying the necessary images into place in our EFI system partition. All that systemd boot has to actually do is set up some configuration files for itself. So the next time we boot, it's going to read these configuration files and those configuration files are going to tell it where to find the images that kernel stub set up. You can see we've got created EFI boot entry Linux boot manager. So this tells your system firmware, your UEFI, or if you're old school, you can kind of call it your BIOS. This tells your system, your hardware, that there is a Linux boot manager, system D boot, that is ready to handle your booting. Now, if you see a bunch of errors and warnings throughout any of these commands, then maybe there is something more complicated that is wrong with your computer. And that's the appropriate point to call up support. If you've got a System76 computer, you can call System76. Um, if you're working at a large company, you can call your own company's IT department. And you can say, I'm at this point in the recovery process and I'm getting errors. And somebody else can read those errors or, you know, you could just Google them yourself as well um, and figure out what they mean and how to fix them. But a lot of the time, just running through all of those commands that I just did, and it's safe to do on a working system once again, because the system was not broken when I started. If your system is working, you can run through all of those, or if the issue is elsewhere, you can run through all of those. It won't make the situation any worse, uh, but there's a very good chance that when you do go and reboot, the system is now going to come up normally. You can enter your encryption password, and the system will boot to your login screen successfully. So guys, there you have it. Now these steps can be useful to you even if you don't have a System76 computer, if you happen to be using Pop! OS on your computer, or even if you're just using regular Ubuntu, a lot of these troubleshooting steps still apply just with slight modifications for the differences such as which bootloader you might be using. The world would be a much better place if everybody knew how to go through basic troubleshooting steps like that, and that's why I wanted to make this video. If you found the video helpful or if you think others might find it helpful, please consider joining the Nerd Club at nerdclub.nots.co for just $3 a month to help me make more content. But for now, that's all I've got. So I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd in the Street, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.